in here and not hit anybody. <laughs> All right, today we're still in the book of James, James chapter 4. Going to be talking about seven verses today. I simply took in my outline and made each of those verses a point. So I got seven points. I practiced this at home and it was about three or four hours long. So I hope you can go till this... No, Rochelle, she won't let me go that long. So it's, it's going to be normal time today, though I do have seven points that we're going to talk about. I hope you picked up one of the, uh, one of the outlines, a real outline. You've got to fill in an awful lot on that, on that today. All right, so let's get into that. Oh, before we get into it, I always have my morning humorous anecdote. And this goes along with the message today. A man said, this is what he said, while my wife and I were shopping at the mall kiosk, a shapely young woman in a short form-fitting dress strolled by. My eyes followed her. Uh-oh. Without looking up from the item she was examining, my wife asked, was it worth the trouble you're in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that today. Here's our text. James chapter 4, we're going to be doing 7 verses, verses 4 down through verse 10. Let me read that, and uh, then we will get into it verse by verse. You adulterous people, James starts out with in verse 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, or verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. And then verse, la verse 10, the last one. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. All right, so I have, uh, here's my outline. Yeah, you can quick fill that out, and then set that aside, and not ever look at that again. Here's my, here's my outline. Number one, our unfaithfulness, verse 4. God's jealousy, verse 5. Our humility, verse 6. Our resisting, resist the devil and he will flee from you, verse 7. Our drawing near, verse 8. Our repentance, verse 9, and our humbling, verse 10. So I simply took the verses and made a verb out of each one of those and built an outline out of that. So let's look at this. Our unfaithfulness with the world. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Isn't it interesting what he starts out with in this verse? Repeatedly in Scripture, our relationship with Christ is compared to a marital relationship. We are called the bride of Christ. He is preparing us for the wedding. There are some parables about that. We see that in the book of Revelation. So throughout scripture, in the Old Testament, God's relationship with Israel was that they were his, his wife. He was their husband. Throughout scripture, our relationship with Christ is, re, is compared to a marital status. After repeatedly addressing his readers throughout the whole book of James so far, he has said, my brethren, my brothers and sisters in Christ. He's talking to believers. Now he gives them a different title in verse 4. He addresses them as you adulterous says. Whoa. I said here, uh, my, uh, you adulteresses is, is a bit of a shock. You know, quite... Uh, um, 
quite a statement he makes of them. Well, why did he say that? Well, that's because they had spiritually, in their love for the world, been committing adultery as the bride of Christ. He is referring to spiritual adultery, not to marital unfaithfulness. Just as marital adultery is a serious sin, it can ruin a marriage. It is a horrible thing that can happen to a husband or a wife to have an affair and, and destroy a marriage. If that's such a serious sin, spiritual adultery is even more serious with our relationship with the Lord. Here's a cross-reference. Very similar to James. Peter and John and James and Paul all use this same theme about our love for the world is cheating on our relationship with God. Here's what John says. Chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, he says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, here's the big question. What is the world? What is worldliness? What is it for a believer to love the world? Well, used to be churches would have their list. You couldn't play cards. You couldn't go dancing. You couldn't go to the movies. You couldn't, you know, they would have their list of what worldliness was. John, in verse 16, kind of defines worldliness for us. He says, for all that is in the world, here's worldliness, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And we could have a whole message. There's a nice three-point sermon right there in verse 16 about what is worldliness. But it is whenever the things of the world become more important to us and we love them, enjoy them more than we love and enjoy our relationship with the Lord, the world. Paul says in 2 Timothy, just probably hours before he was um, martyred for the sake of Jesus Christ, he's writing 2 Timothy, and he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. What a sad situation when a believer in his life loves the things of Satan's world more than he loves the spiritual things of the Lord. Another cross-reference, John 17. John 17, well, what is our relationship with the world? Well, as you remember, we preached on John 17 a number of months back when we were in our series on prayer. John 17 is Christ's high priestly prayer, praying for his disciples, not only praying for his disciples, but he says in there, I pray not only for these, but for those who will believe on me. He prayed literally, he prayed for us generations from the New Testament times. And he kind of, in this prayer, gives us an idea. What is our relationship with the world? Well, let me pluck a few verses out of there. Verse 14, he says this. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. There's that word. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. They are not of the world. They don't belong to the world. They have been redeemed. They have been saved. They've been changed. I appreciated those songs that Mike had, talking about emphasizing that through the Lord Jesus Christ, our lives can be rescued and changed. And, and because we have a relationship with the Lord... They are not of the world. But later on in the prayer, a few verses later, verse 16, Jesus says this about his disciples. He says, they are not of the world. Oh, this was kind of repeating verse 14. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Then in verse 18, he says this. He says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. God wants us purposely. We are sent by him to go into the world, but we are not of the world. We are to bring the light. We are to bring the salt of the gospel to the world. James earlier in our series on James said that true religion that is undefiled before God is visiting the orphans and the widows. And you remember the last phrase? 
keeping oneself unspotted from the world. We're to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. We're sent into the world to bring them to light, but we are not to love the world. We are not to be of the world. John 17. Secondly, God's desire for our faithfulness. Huh? Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Now, I've been using, ever since I started here, I've been using the ESV, Good Conservative Evangelical uh, Translation. Holman, pa pastor before me, used the uh, Holman Bible. I can't remember. There's four letters. The New Holman Standard, something like that. The Holman. Um, this verse, well, there's a couple problems with this verse. First of all, it is very hard to translate from the Greek. That spirit, is it referring to the Holy Spirit or God's new spirit that he's created in us? Or is it our worldly spirit that wants to go to the world? And, and it's, it's a, it is a, if you check different translations, there are some different translations of this verse. I think that the ESV is accurate and many of them have it like this. So if you read what it's saying. Or do you suppose that no purpose that the scripture said that let me read it again. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says so he has a quote here. The second problem is we, we don't know where James is quoting this from. So, so, um, so here's what it says. There, there does not seem to be a specific verse in the Old Testament that James is referring to when he says that. Let me go back to that. That he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. So that, where exactly is it? There are some verses that are kind of similar um, the consensus of conservative Bible scholars, I've been reading a bunch on this week, is that it is taking the scriptural teaching as a whole. The Bible teaches that God has a relationship with us and it wants us to be faithful to him. Let me ask you about a word. If I were to ask you, is jealousy wrong? There, there's a good question. A lot of you would immediately say, jealousy, well, no, we're not supposed to have jealousy in our lives. Well, what if a husband kind of is, is flirting with some other woman? Is, the wife, is it okay for the wife to be a bit upset about that? Yeah, that husband should stop that kind of stuff or vice versa. Jealousy in a marriage is is okay because you are you have taken a vow to be faithful to one another. Well, if you go back to that verse, or do you not suppose that the, the purpose of scripture says he talking about God yearns jealousy jealously over the spirit he has made to dwell in us. God is jealous of our faithfulness with him and is saddened when we love the world. We need to think about that. God is jealous for our faithfulness to him, just as a wife must be faithful to her husband. One time, when I was in seminary, uh, we were going to Standale Baptist Church out there in, in, in Walker, in Standale, down on Lake Michigan Drive as you come in, come in from Allendale. I was a youth pastor there. I was in seminary, and they had me preach. And uh, I got up there. I was preaching from the book of Hosea, and I got up there, and I kind of looked very, very sad, and I said to the congregation, I says, uh, this is going to be very tough for me today. I have to tell the congregation, and I was very serious and somber at it, and I says to them, and Laurel was sitting right down there in the, in the pew, I says, my wife has left me for another man. And everyone in the congregation goes, oh. and there was an old Dutchman, and he, go, he, he was a card, and he goes, oh no, 
he kind of he kind of knew I was joking about that. And then I said, that was the message that Hosea had for the people of Israel. You remember the book of Hosea? Um, Hosea was told to marry Gomer. I know, funny name, but she was probably a very beautiful wife. And then she was unfaithful to him. And the Lord told Hosea to go get her back. He literally bought her back. So she became a concubine into slavery. And he bought her back and says, you are going to be faithful to me only. And that was God's message to Israel. That's God's message to us. We are to be faithful to him only. Friendship and loving the world is like committing spiritual adultery. God is jealous for our faithfulness. I said, take a pick. You are married to God or to the world. You can, can you imagine? I read this illustration, thought I'd put it in here. Can you imagine a couple that gets married and a month later the husband says to his wife, I'm going out tonight with my old girlfriend. Whoa, whoa, huh? He says, I love you, but I want to keep in touch with her too. Uh, needless to say, that marriage is in big trouble. But isn't that exactly what we do when we love those things of the world that are displeasing to God? We love the world. When you get married, you vow to forsake all others and to be devoted exclusively to your spouse. And when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you accept him as Lord, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you make him Lord of your life, we are to be faithful to him only and not to the world. Point number three, God's desire for humility. Now James has rebuked them and yelled at them, and he can see that they are, oh, what do we do? What do we do, James? Well, then he goes on. But he gives more grace. Isn't that a nice phrase? James has just got through yelling at him, you know. It's like when Mike is up here, and that big thundering voice of Mike, Mike, and yelling at us and telling us what we should do, and we're all, oh, no, oh, no, but... God gives grace. Huh? God gives grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the, po the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Grace. The word translated grace in the New Testament comes from the Greek word charis. We get charismatic from that. We got a couple of names, you know, charissa. Uh, those come from the Greek word, which means grace, which means favor, blessing, or kindness. We can all extend grace to others. We can be gracious towards others. I, I, having my devotion yesterday, I talked about being kind and being gracious towards others, uh, being concerned about other people, asking them how their day is, uh, things of that nature. We can be gracious to others. But when the word grace is used in connection with God towards us, it takes on a more powerful meaning. Grace is God choosing to bless us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. You have heard it defined as unmerited favor. God giving us blessing that we don't deserve in any way. God would be totally just. God would be totally just if he walked over to earth. I like my background. I, I found that background on. Uh, if he walked over to the earth and he plucked the earth out of its axis and threw it straight into hell. God would be totally just in doing that. But he is merciful and he gives us grace. By sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. It is his benevolence to the undeserving. He gives more grace. Where is this quoted from? James quotes uh, from the Old Testament. He uh, gives grace. To, he resists the proud. But gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 3.34 seems to be uh, where it comes from. Now again this is the ESV. And other translations, uh, in fact, it seems that James got this from the Septuagint, which was an early Greek translation of the Old Testament. So this verse, as you read it, doesn't seem so close, but it really is if you go back to the original language. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives 
favor or grace. That seems to be where this verse is quoted from in the book of James. There's another one that's kind of similar. Proverbs 29, verse 23, it says, One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. So a similar idea there. Most Bible scholars believe that Proverbs 3.34 is where James is quoting that from. Now what's interesting is this. Look at this translate this uh, cross-reference. 1 Peter 5, the second part of the verse. I cut out part of the first part of the verse to shorten it up a little bit. Peter says this, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for and then he quotes Peter quotes the exact same verse that James quoted from the Old Testament. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I found some interesting similarities between the book of James and the book of Peter. Some very similar ideas that they both are expressing to one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Point number four. I'm huh? moving right through these things. I guess I better, though, move right through these things. Our resisting the enemy. Verse 7. James says, submit, continuing on with humbling ourselves. We need to humble ourselves before God. We need to submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Allow him to be the Lord of our lives. Not allowing Satan to be the Lord of our lives. We are to resist the devil. And it says, he will flee from you. Resist comes from the Greek word, an anthistemi. It was a military term in the classical Greek, and I copied this right out of the lexicon. It was used by uh, an ancient Greek writer. Now listen to this. It was a military term. It means to strongly resist an opponent. Can you get a picture of the enemy coming at you and you with your forces are to resist him? You are to confront him and stop him. Take a firm stand against the enemy, part of the word. So that literally means resist him. Cross-reference, Matthew 4. Matthew 4, what happened in Matthew 4? What happened in Matthew 4? Jesus was baptized, and then he was led out into the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and then the tempter came, and Jesus resisted him. It's interesting. You can learn a lot about resisting the devil from that passage where Jesus resists the devil. Jesus quoted scripture at the devil. Isn't that interesting? We can use scripture as a tool in our resisting of Satan. Let me get to the verses, verses 3 and 4. And, the, and this is just one of them. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Remember, Jesus had fasted 40 days, and I'm sure was very hungry. I can't go three hours in between breakfast and lunch without snooching from the cupboard, you know. And, and after supper, I'm full of everything but I still snitch out of the cupboard, you know? Jesus has gone 40 days, I'm sure. In fact, Hebrews, book of Hebrews says, Jesus was tempted in all points just like we are. This was a very valid temptation. People might scoff at it and say, oh, well, Jesus couldn't sin. Jesus couldn't obey the devil. He was the son of God. Yeah, but he was fully man. This was a genuine temptation on his life. How did he resist him? Jesus said, but he answered, it is written, it is written in God's word, the power of the Bible. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He quoted scripture back at Satan to resist the devil. We need to stop loving the world. Satan gets in there and wants to tempt us with worldly things. We need to resist that by knowing scripture, memorizing scripture, using scripture in our lives to resist the devil. Another cross-reference, 1 Peter. I, again, I found some similarities between 1 Peter and the book of James. Verses 8, and I shortened verse 9 for us a little bit here. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, there's a name for him, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. 
That is quite a statement. I don't know if you ever ever do. I, I've gotten into a kick of watching these National Geographics. Actually, I go to the BBC channel and they have this um, Blue Planet. Is it Blue Planet? No, that's the one that's all underwater. Planet Earth is a whole series they have. And they often show the savannas of, of, of Africa and they show the lions, how the lions sneak up on the zebras and, and attack and they attack as a pride and they'll, cha they'll single out a weaker one or one that gets separated from the, from the herd of, of zebras and then they'll jump on it and they'll go for its throat and they'll take it down and, and it, oh, it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing to watch. Peter says your adversary is just like one of those lions trying to single you out from the pack. You know, there is help among Christian brothers and sisters to encourage one another. He is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Then he says in verse 9, uses that same word that James uses, resist him, firm in your faith. We are to resist the devil, say no to him. Like two armies clashing, we are to stand firm and keep the enemy at bay. We are to resist the devil. Ah! Wait a minute, what is this? Who stuck that in there? Eagle! Yeah. <laughs> I think Mike stuck that in there when I wasn't looking. <laughs> oh, I just thought I'd wake everyone up and stuck that, I stuck that in there a little bit. <laughs> they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like Eagle. the eagles. I don't know the word patriots is in, isn't, isn't a biblical word, is it? I don't know, I don't know that that's in the Bible. Anyway. I just thought I'd wake you up a little bit, stuck that in. What's that? The tempter's Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom Brady prowls around. Oh, that's more like the Eagles defense. <laughs> anyway, getting back to the message. I don't know who stuck that in there. Point number five. Our drawing near to God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded boy. He's, he's, he's laying it on them, isn't he? But he says, draw near to God. I was watching a movie the other day. Uh, these two teenagers, they were sitting on the, on the bleachers watching a, a basketball game. And they kind of liked it. You know, they were younger teenagers, and they kind of liked each other. And the guy is sitting there, and he looks over there kind of shyly. And then he slides over just a little bit in that, and sitting in that, in that bleachers, you know, and then she notices that. So she slides a little bit closer to him, yeah? I thought that was kind of a neat picture. We are to draw near to God. Spend time with Him. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in your relationship with Him. I got up this morning, my feet hit the, hit the floor. I don't know why, I had some coffee last night. I didn't sleep very well, so I was a little bit groggy, but I forced myself to do this. I said this, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to, whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And I started my day off by looking immediately to the Lord before I even got out of the bedroom that morning, this morning. We need to do that. We need to draw near to God. We need to look to Him. We need to be walking with Him. It's, it's, it's a wonderful phrase in the Old Testament talking about Enoch. The book of Hebrews talks about Enoch, and it says, Enoch walked with God. Isn't that a neat phrase? You can just see the picture going through the day. Enoch gets up, and he starts his day, and God is with him. And he's walking with God. He's drawn near to God. And they have a conversation with God. God, I, I pray that you'll bless this day. Man, I have a good day, you know. And he and, uh, gets in his car. Enoch got in his car and was driving to... Oh, <laughs> putting it in modern situations. And he spends time in prayer. He walks with God. Enoch, imagine in your mind what that phrase means. Enoch walked with God. And then God blessed him for that. God, he was not because God took him, that verse says. He, God raptured him out of the world. We are to draw near to God. If we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. How do we draw near to God? We cleanse ourselves. We get rid of those worldly things that are in our lives. All right. Point number six. Oh, cross-reference. Hebrews chapter 10. 19, 20, 21, and part of 22. 
Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way that he opposed for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have the great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, there it is, with a true heart in full assurance of faith. What is this referencing to? Well, in the Old Testament, they had the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, they had a building that was divided into two compartments. One was the holy place, and the other was the most holy place. And that most holy place, well, the high priest only went once a year to offer the blood of a spotless lamb onto the mercy seat that was a cover over the Ark of the Covenant once a year to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. He was the only one who could draw near to God because we were sinners. <laughs> Some of you have heard this before, but it was, it's a Jewish tradition. It really doesn't say, it does say in the Old Testament that the high priest was to have pomegranates and bells on the bottom of his garment. So that as he walked, the pomegranates would hit the bells and there would be a sound. Jewish tradition was that they tied a, when he went in there, they tied a rope around one of his legs. Because if he was to do something wrong in the Holy of Holies and God struck him dead, how would you ever get him out of there? You know, nobody else can go in there. So tradition, Jewish tradition had that they tied a rope around his leg so that they could, they could haul him out of there if he were to fall dead. I think that's kind of interesting. Nobody else could draw near to God. But you remember when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to that curtain that separated the whole most, the holy of holies from the rest of the tabernacle. It was rent from top to bottom. It's like God went to the top of it and went and tore it apart so that we can have access and nearness to God. In Hebrews, just like James says, draw near to God. Point number six, our repentance. Now I want to point something out, out here. Verse nine never uses the word repent or repentance, okay? I think James O is describing it. Wretched, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. I think James here is talking about our repentance of our worldliness, we need to feel horrible about our worldliness and loving the world more than loving God. You adulterers, adulteresses, James had said earlier, we're to repent of that. I looked at the word about the word repentance. In the Bible, the word repentance means to change one's mind. It is meta, which means change. Metanoia means to change your mind. The Bible also talks about true repentance will result in a change of actions. It's not true repentance if you don't change your life from it. True True repentance means you change your actions. Acts 26 verse 20 declares, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. But along with repentance, there often is a, uh, a emotional element to repentance, a mourning, a weeping. When God caused the great awakenings to come, the first great awakenings back in the 1700s, and then the second great awakening, when God's Spirit moved on the face of the United States and in England, and there was great revivals that broke out, they were characterized by repentance, where Christians would begin to weep and mourn because of their sinfulness. Remember last week, we looked at Isaiah chapter 6, and when Isaiah saw the holiness of the Lord, he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. He repented. We need to understand how much our seeking the world and loving the world hurts God. And we need to repent of that. Point seven, our humbling ourselves. Hey, I'm almost done here. 
Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. What have I said here? Well, I simply got a cross-reference here. First Peter, again, similarities between James and First Peter. First Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, Peter says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. And then verse 7. I threw verse 7 in there, too, because it's such a wonderful verse. Casting all your anxieties on Him, him because he cares for you. We are to come to God in repentance and humility and draw near to him. All of those phrases that James used in this and put worldliness out of our lives, resist the devil and seek God. I wonder how much you are doing that in your life. Well, here we are. Conclusion. James says for a believer, Friendship with the world is like committing adultery against the Lord. That is quite a statement that we need to consider. James says we need to humble ourselves before the Lord, repent of our love for the world, and we need to draw near to God. The Lord will forgive and draw near to us. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that we as believers, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, would put worldliness out of our life. Friendship with the world is enmity with you, Father. And may our lives be committed to you. May we be like Enoch, who walked with God. Father, bless this message to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mike, you